Hello. Hello. Uh, so uh, this is a museum FAQ video. Uh, I'm Paul Orselli, president and chief instigator at POW, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Dan Spock. Um, Dan, maybe first off, you could just give uh, folks a little bit about your background. Okay, so I've been in the museum field for over 30 years. Um, I started out um, working in a children's museum, and I think that's uh, at, a, at a pretty low rank. I mean, I was doing a lot of exhibit maintenance and working um, you know, on graphics for exhibits uh, at the Boston Children's Museum. And um, I, I, I would say that what I learned there was a lot about exhibit prototyping, a lot about um, making exhibitions that are really responsive to an audience. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, families with small children. Um, and, and I would say that's where I learned my trade, my craft, you know, um, most of it received wisdom, none of it, you know, academic journals or anything like that. I left there after 13 years and went to a project that was called the Museum of Creativity Project. Mm -hmm. um, by, by the time I left the Children's Museum, I was an exhibit designer, but I made a transition to being um, an exhibit developer at the Museum of Creativity Project. And th this was a weird uh, project because it was all about creating um, exhibitions that were supposed to be about the creative process rather than the products of creativity. Um, so I would say that, that even though this was, you know, uh, a project that was a spectacular failure in the sense that ironically the museum that we were supposed to create never was created, uh, it did um, give me an opportunity to get a crash course on museum studies and creativity theory, which was uh, which is a some something that's a fairly nebulous body of knowledge and is studied from all these different fascinating perspectives, you know, neuroscience, um, learning theory, um, um, history, um, anthropology, uh, and on and on and on. So it's it's a very um, divergent uh, uh, body of, of knowledge and discipline. I left that uh, in Los Angeles and came to the Minnesota Historical Society, where for 20 years I was doing history exhibits and, and uh, running the exhibits program there and, and also for a period of time, the um, public programs division of the Historical Society. I was the director of the main exhibit facility in um, St. Paul, you know, with, with 40,000 square feet of exhibits and depending on the state of the economy, it, I had, you know, either, you know, uh, 100 people working for me or 14 people working for me. So, <laughs> you know, so it was, um, but, but, you know, I, I would say that the, the thing that was really cool about working in Minnesota was, you know, they hired me because they were really interested in, in how you make history um, more interesting as a, as a destination. Uh, history museums as a destination for families with children. They had done all this research and, and learned that um, history museums uh, generally attract an older, pretty monocultural crowd, um, and um, and they wanted to break that mold. And so um, I came on with the charge to kind of expand the base. Um, you know, looking at science centers that in any given city to four or five, six times the number of visitors as the local history museum, you know, the rationale was if we can make, if we can position a history museum as something more engaging for a broader audience, we'll do better. And, and, and maybe if not equal, the Science Center will at least um, uh, do, it, do decent, you know, uh, uh, do a decent job compared. And so, you know, so what we were doing was taking, um, a traditional state history museum idea and infusing it with, you know, concepts like interactivity, which in history was pretty limited. You know, you might you might go to a historic site, you know, and churn some butter or dip some candles or something like that. But if you went to a history museum, it was pretty much objects and labels. You know, that is um, uh, that was sort of the, the 
the palette that we were that, that, we, that people had came come to expect and and that was a pretty limiting perception you know people were looking at that and saying well that's okay if for, for people who are real history buffs, but you know, for the rest of us, it's not that interesting. So, um, so we, you know, we kind of uh, approached it um, philosophically, like we were working with a big uh, exhibit paint box, right? So, um, thinking if you know, what would what would this museum be like if we if we expanded our toolkit beyond? Um, uh, just objects and labels to um, uh, storytelling techniques using media, uh, um, uh, interactivity, more hands-on activities, more uh, more things that were friendly to different types of learning styles. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to make a museum that was accessible. Um, you know, and and I think when we when we looked at um, storytelling too, you know, we were really, you know, interested in, in kind of flipping the script, the script on what a, what a history museum would normally do. You know, most history museums were really approaching um, history as, as a kind of a master narrative. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, you had um, a kind of a third person point of view that was describing events Either nationally or locally, in these very broad and generalized terms, like you know, when Italian Americans came to, you know, St. Paul, blah blah blah, you know, um, and and our perception was, and and this was borne out by the visitor research that we were doing, that that kind of narrative left a lot of people cold. You know, they they couldn't see the individual stories, the stories of families and communities were not re uh, represented in a granular enough level of detail that they could really see the human face uh, of history. So, you know, so we, we really pursued the, an approach where we would, we would not just collect objects or represent collected objects, but we were representing stories that we would collect. So we would go out and we would find people that had experiences that were that were interesting and maybe more divergent than the kinds of stories that that were being told um, traditionally, and um, and we would we would dramatize those through the craft of exhibits using immersive media techniques, media shows, um, interactivity, and so forth. We would really try to dramatize the events of history as seen through the lens of ordinary people. And, and that was another piece of this too, is that we were, we, it, rather than telling the story of presidents and governors and treaty makers and, you know, um, uh, uh, the rich and the powerful um, who had left a, a fair amount of material behind to work from and were, you know, had high schools named after them and so forth. Most of them being white ma males, of course. Um, to, to branch out from there and and just you know represent the people who worked in breweries or you know uh, uh, farmed or um, you know worked as railroad porters or uh, you know um, um, school teachers or or whatever you know trying to find and you know and the philosophy of that was not only that this there was a sort of social justice aspect to this which was more full. Um, sense of history, one that really valued the contributions that people make in the historical narrative at every level, but, but also, um, you know, kind of acknowledging that that would send a message that, um, that you are a part of history too, that you, the visitor, are, are, you know, with your family, with your school, with your friends, you know, are, are, are part of the historical process. Um, and um, so it was, it was very, you know, it was very idealistic, a very pluralistic idea about how to do history. And, um, um, and I would say um, an exciting way to approach it, given that, um, you know, history up to, up to the point that we were really tackling this had gotten pretty sclerotic, you know, it had gotten very, um, very high band, very uh, 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 dusty and kind of backward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you touched on um, 
Uh oh, getting a little feedback there. Um, you touched on um, the aspect of uh, the stuff. <laughs> and right. uh, I know a lot of people, when you think about um, a history museum, especially small, like historical societies, yep. it almost feels like they've taken the contents of several grandparents' attics and just sort of arranged them around the perimeter of the rooms they yeah. have. And so uh, I I'd just be curious, you, you know, you touched on uh, the, the sort of uh, idealistic techniques and uh, sharing the common stories, but w what might be some uh, sort of specific examples or tips that you might have for somebody who's working with a collection of important old white men's stuff or just a, a bunch of old grandparents' attics sort of stuff and making that less... Uh, one time my kids, we were at a history museum and they said, let's leave, everything here is old and brown, you know? And you look around, <laughs> you see these yellow documents and this these yeah. old chairs, these old wooden chairs and things and it's like, sepia tone photographs it's all this sort of sort of yeah. monochromatic old and brown stuff i was like yeah let's leave you're right so i mean how can what are what are some specific ways that you think about or you thought about uh when you were in minnesota that uh other people could apply to their situations well well one of the things that was um i, I would say a steep challenge for us is that we had to come to grips with the fact that our collection, which was about a quarter of a million 3D objects, you know, that was the basis of what we had to work with. We had quite a deep archive there as well, but we had to we had to come to grips with the fact that that collection had really grown without much rhyme or reason. Um, it had grown actually most of its history without an actual gallery um, to show any of it in. So you know, it it did have the quality to the untrained eye. It looked like, a, a, you know, an episode of American Pickers, you, you know, <laughs> um, you know, you know, and the, I think part of the problem that history museums have that art museums maybe don't, and, and I'm sure art museums will take issue with this and they can argue with me because um, I haven't thought of their issues all that closely, but, but we, uh, in history museums, we collect a lot of really ordinary stuff. You know, it's very prosaic stuff. And so, so um, you know, it's wooden buckets and ladles and... Shirt collars. <laughs> yeah, and like old shoes, you know, and cabbage shredders. And, you know, I mean, it's, you know, and so, so there's an aspect of, of historical collections which are, which are, are thought of in terms of they are examples of things, representative examples of things, rather than say in an art museum where you have fine things, like extraordinary examples of things, right? But weirdly, history institutions also collect some fine things as well. So none of it makes any sense. You know, we have silver tea services made by Paul Revere and, yeah. you know, and, and, and stuff that's really quite valuable too. Um, you know, so um, so none of it makes any sense. I think the thing that we, you know, to take a take a particular example, you know, I know that at Minnesota there were at least six different spinning wheels. You know, they had been collected as a representative example of different styles of spinning wheels, and I think out of that six, only one did we know anything about who actually owned it right you know a name that went with it um i think that that we started to think about objects more as vehicles for specific stories mm. we were interested in them not just to represent an example of an object in an, in an array of other objects but think about them as you know if a person had been a seamstress for their life work and um and that had kind of defined them as a as a career or as a profession, then we wanted not only, you know, the kit that they used to make things, but we also wanted something from that person's life, um, if not, you know, a narrative that described who they were, when they lived, and, and what they did, and how they died, and how many children they had, or whatever. 
but but also um, you know maybe their own words you know was was there a diary account or a letter or something that um, that makes this object breathe and so uh, I think one of the tensions that we always struggled with there is that we would look in our collection and we often wouldn't we just wouldn't have we'd have an exhibit theme let's say it's the World War II generation um, and we would have very little in the in the collection that would represent mm -hmm. the lives of individuals of that, that generation. Um, and so we, we would wind up actually having to go out and find people who had great stories and hope that they had a little something in their attic or in their trunk um, that could help, you know, illustrate for us um, th their lives um, in some meaningful uh, and compelling way. And so, so a lot of, uh, you know, a dirty little secret about our exhibits is that a lot of the material in those exhibits were, were loans because we just didn't have them in the collection. You know, we, we might have some examples and those would be useful, but we often didn't have the, the object that went with the story. Well, and if, if um, your institution or the people before you were collecting things because they were from some important person or they were some valuable, monetarily valuable, like tea set or that, they weren't necessarily collecting them because of their relationship to a human story. That's right. I, I, and I think that's really important. I mean, I, I, I guess my question is, so do you think that when you, um, more in a more directed way made that shift to use objects as a vehicle for human stories that was the that was the reason that visitors could connect to the exhibitions and the objects more forcefully uh, or what what do you, what are your thoughts about that well yeah i mean it was interesting because in the in the mid 90s you know we were doing a lot of research on what visitors liked about history or didn't like about history or what their perceptions were about about history and um and that coincided with some work that was being done in academia uh, uh, in particular um roy rosenzweig and and uh, david thielen wrote this amazing book called the presence of the past and what they were looking you know what they were trying to understand was you know, there was, there was a, I think, a kind of an assumption going around that wasn't really backed. It was anecdotal. It wasn't backed by research that Americans' understanding of history was abysmal, that they are basically, you know, living in a state of protracted amnesia about everything in the past. And that, um, that you know, uh, our sense of connection to, to history, you know, just almost non existent. Um, what Rosenzweig and Thielen found. Um, really resonated with what we were finding in our research, which was that people were actually very passionate about the past and were very connected to the past, but they were connected to it in a way that had more to do with the stories of their own families, communities, um, you know, children, and so forth. And they, and they just weren't seeing that as being historic. They weren't seeing it as history. They were comfortable with the word the past, but, it, but once you started talking about history, it sounded like you were talking about someone other than them. Yeah, George, you know? George Washington, not them. Yeah. Right, you know, and, um, you know, so, so, you know, we saw our challenge as being um, about, in, in a certain way, to bring affirmation to people who, um, who showed a lot of value, you know, who really value the past in a very meaningful and direct way through their own experience and to sort of affirm for them that, yeah, that kind of past is the kind of history that we care about and collect in a, mu in a museum. It's not somebody else's story that we're interested in. We're interested in your story too. You it, know, it, um, it, it's, and, uh, it, it's like you were talking about, you were mentioning science centers. It's like when, uh, you go to uh, a science center and they have an exhibition about this is math. You know, <laughs> there are all these things that people, oh, that's math. You know, like, uh, yeah. really, that's math. I mean, it's it, it's it yeah. sounds like 
it's sort of an equivalent thing that you're you're telling people really this is history your your stories your connections to your past is important i mean it, it seems like also that validation and and letting people know that their stories and their memories are important too that it's not just this sort of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and and the people right. who have the people who have high schools named after them. Right. Yeah. And um, I mean, so one of the things that I I found most gratifying and moving about the experiences that we had uh, doing exhibits this way is that we would we would develop relationships with people who had a story to tell. Um, a lot of our work was detective work. You know, who who who's out there who who jumped during D-Day, who's still living um, and has some stuff and has a story to tell and wants to talk to us about it. Um, you know, who's out there who worked in a flour mill on the packing floor with the one pound bags, who was a woman who worked on, on that floor? You know, who, 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 you know who's out, out there who has that story to tell? Um, we'd, we'd track those people down and be kind of like working, you know, working a, a, a network tree that, that tracked people down. And then um, when, when those things would go on exhibit, we would invite everybody who had participated in this gathering process to join us for the opening. And the looks on their faces, you know, the idea, the idea that, they, that their story would ever, you know, be considered important enough to be represented in a museum just tickled them pink, like they couldn't yeah. believe it, you know? We, like, we, we underestimate how important that is when you work in a museum, but to, yeah, to include people in, in an exhibition or in something in the museum, yeah, they're, they're really, it means a lot. And it's, it's, it, it's, of course, it's impossible to include everyone. Um, so you kind of have to figure out ways that people can, maybe while they're visiting, they can contribute. Um, but, I think, but I think it's important to have people represented that are like the people who are coming to visit. So it's, it's like if, you know, at the very least, there's some point of identification, you know, um, um, okay, that's not my story, but it's a lot like my story. Um, one of the things that we found out that was really interesting by doing some visitor research, you know, we had, we had always expect, um, had sort of um, um, anticipated that people would come to us, they weren't a blank slate, like they had their own lives, their own prior experience. Um, they had their own motivations for coming to the museum. And we knew by doing tracking and timing and observation of, of visitors and museums that, that they would defy, you know, the kind of general logic of an exhibit as it was planned and designed they wouldn't necessarily dwell on everything they would raise. They would pick and choose what they would choose to pay attention uh, to. And since most, almost all of our visitors were visiting in social groups, the way they would, they would um, make meaning out of their experiences would, would be reflected in the kind of conversations that they would have with each other. And um, so we had, we had, just by observing, we knew that some of this stuff was going on, but we did a really interesting project on an exhibit called Open House that was up at the Historical Society for over a decade. And we, with people's permission, we, we put tape recorders on them and we taped their conversations. And then without having a whole lot of expectation of, about what they would be talking about, we we looked at their at the transcripts and we looked for patterns you know in the transcripts and try to figure out well what's going on here well you know at first it was really daunting because we found that a lot of what was going on seemed completely idiosyncratic you know i mean um you know people were choosing to stop and dwell on completely different things you know if they were visiting with kids they had a different kind of an idea and a different level of conversation than if it was an old couple visiting together or a young adult couple or, or, um, or a young group. So, um, so at first it was really hard to discern any sense out of, out of this sort of 
un, uh, you know, the sort of disaggregated uh, confusion, this chaotic uh, um, sense of data. But when we started to really look at it, we realized that there were a couple of patterns that were very, very uh, uh, common. In fact, so common they happened every single time. And what would happen is that people would notice something in the environment that would trigger for them a memory or an idea or a thought that was something from their own experience. You know, quite often they would, they would read the label or they would do the activity that we had prepared as part of the environment. Um, but the way they chose to talk about it was, was very, very personal. And it was, it was almost like the exhibit was acting as a conversation piece uh, through which they could not only, sh not only compare their lives to what was being represented in the exhibit, like, oh, we, you know, we had a bed just like that, or, you know, your grandfather um, worked in a brewery just like that. He lived on the east side in a house like this. You know, oh, you're, you know, um, you know, do you remember uh, that, that year when we were in college, we lived next door to the Hmong family? You know, there were all these sorts of ways that people would choose to, to talk about it, but it, um, so they were comparing their their own story, their own personal history, to the history being represented in the exhibit. Um, um, but they were also toggling back and forth between my story, exhibit story, my story, exhibit story. So that to us was very very interesting, and and so you know it was almost like the points of relevancy had to be there on a on a very big and sort of generalized uh, schema. But the precise points of relevancy really were going to be very different from group to group, you know. And that, that just hit, hit us like a bolt from the blue. It, it's yeah. like, oh, my God, you know. People, <laughs> people well, that's, that, that also strikes me that that then becomes almost a way you can reverse engineer your thinking about collecting the stories. Exactly. So that okay, so is this a story, is this an object, is this a context that people are going to be able to find some sort of common yep. touchstone exactly. to their own lives so that you get into that toggling back and forth, like you said. I think, I mean, I think that's like, th that's always what you think about too when you think of a, a great book or a great movie or a great exhibition, maybe, you know, what are these common touchstones that people are like, oh yeah, you know, this, this makes me think about falling in love, or this makes me think about my grandfather, or this makes yep. me think about my first job, or, or what have you. I, I think that's, that, that's really important. I mean, I, of course, it's one of those things, after you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, of course, but it, sometimes <laughs> it takes, takes a long time to get to that point. Well, you know, it, it, for us, it's like we had to think about you know, it challenged, it challenged everything. It challenged, you know, how do you actually structure an exhibit? Do you structure it chronologically or do you, do you lay it out more like a big buffet, understanding that people are going to feed themselves, but how they feed themselves is going to be very idiosyncratic, depending on what it is they like to eat, you know. Um, you know, part of what we, part of what we thought about too was, you know, the, the emotional modalities that are involved. You know, I think his, uh, traditionally historical institutions were really, you know, really right up there in the prefrontal cortex. It's like facts. Also, data, also, you know? also deliberately trying to be neutral. The, the museums oh, yeah. who were always trying to be neutral. Yeah, you know, and, and um, uh, to such an extent that, you know, there, there was a sort of bloodless quality to it. You know, it, it's like, um, dispassionate to a fault, you know, whereas, um, you know, if you read a work of fiction or you were talking about film, um, you know, part of what's engaging about it is, is the drama, you know, the drama the, you know, so humans are not, uh, are, are, are not just intelligible in crowds and how they behave in crowds, which is often how, um, you know, traditional historiography um, presents them, particularly in museums, they're also intelligible as actors, you know, human actors who yeah. have, who have motive, motives, dilemmas. You know, they're trying to be virtuous. They're trying to overcome their 
their shortcomings. They're trying to uh, succeed. You know, they're celebrating when they finally accomplish something. They're ruminating and bitter when they fail. You know, <laughs> they are not. You know, they, they are not bloodless. <laughs> they are not bloodless, right? And um, and that's the kind of thing that. You know, it's interesting. It, it always interested me that biographies sell much better than um, broader historiography. Um, you know, there's a reason why, you know, it's Hamilton and Einstein and, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the, uh, I think biographies tend to kind of bring the focus in a little tighter. You know, the historical period that people live in is, is, is this really cool context that plays a part in maybe what you'd call a kind of costume drama. But it, you know, the, um, the fact that people are, are both contributing, creating, living, having children, you know, trying to survive in a community of other human beings, all those sorts of things. Um, um, those are the, I think those are the things that are the connecting points. And we felt like those were, those were that was the un, uh, the unexploited capital, if you will, of history uh, in museums. And, and objects, you know, are, are just really about that, you know. Um, um, you know, an object is so much more powerful. An example that I, I like to use was, you know, I'd show people this pair of children's ice skates that are just totally battered. And I'd say, are these ice skates, you know, extraordinary or are they just, you know, junk store ice skates, you know. And most people look at them, they say that's that's junk store stuff. You know, I can go down it's trash. You know, I can go down to the to the main street to the thrift sto store and they've got the same pair of skates on the shelf and I can get them for, you know, five dollars, you know. Um, and I say, well what if I told you that these are Wayne Gretzky skates? That these are the skate these are the first skates that Wayne Gretzky, <laughs> Wayne Gretzky used. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like the wear and tear on them, the smallness of them, uh, you know, um, all of a sudden that has a lot of meaning, you know, for, for people who know who Wayne Gretzky is. Not yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, you know, it's... But, but, you know and so, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that you have to be thinking about uh, when you create uh, history exhibits. You have to think about how something prosaic, something ordinary, can be illustrative in a larger sense um, and can bring people closer to the experiences of other people in ways that are meaningful. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe uh, for now, that's a good last word. Our, our, uh, I'm trying to keep our conversations compact. We'll have to have another conversation. Sure. Uh, do, I have, do I have time for just one more thought? Yeah, sure. Okay. so. So one of the things I think about a lot is, um, you know, there's a, you know, we had this style of history, history that we were doing that was very story driven, um, but but also trying to think about, well, is that just the domain of history, or is that something that science museums and um, children's museums and um, natural history museums could also think about? And I'm not thinking about, okay, well, what's the story of the of dinosaur uh, Sue, you know, as she goes shopping for, you know, her prey or carrion or whatever it is Sue likes to eat. But, but it, could, it could be the story of the paleontologists, you know, um, and their work uh, struggle and the kinds of things that they go through. You know, there have been a handful of, um, I think, great um, natural history exhibits, one on Darwin, another one on Einstein that were much more kind of story driven. Um, you know, are there stories like that that we can tell um, in history contexts that make use of the power of story in the way that we use it in history that could also, you know, I think now that we live in the Holocene age and we're really, uh, you know, living in a world that's created by humans, even the natural environment is, is has been touched and, and shaped in some way by human inter intervention. You know, is there a way to bring the stories of people who are impacted and living in this new context, living in interaction with nature 
at its at its most sublime, but also at its most dangerous and at its worst. Um, um, are those opportunities um, for uh, science centers to expand the base of people who are who are interested in what and in the in the stories that they have to tell? And 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 in a bigger sense, if if we're interested in mobilizing people for social action in the 21st century when we are, you know, in severe climate jeopardy, um, bringing human stories to the, to the work as a way to, um, to, um, to give people examples, to give them a sense of empowerment, a sense of choice about what to do, a sense of the impact of, of, of the world on people's lives. I think it's a really cool opportunity out there as yet mm -hmm. relatively unexploited. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, so. that is a good last word and a last thought. I thank you for taking the time today, Dan Spock. Maybe, although maybe I'm going to ask you one last question about okay. your t about your t-shirt. Oh yeah. There's a story there, I think. Okay. Well, this is, um, this is a Minneapolis Millers yeah. t-shirt, and the Millers were a farm team. Uh, most of the most of the time they existed, they were a farm team for the Boston Red Sox, which are my favorite yeah. team. So there's a little secret message in there. I lived in Minnesota, Minneapolis, actually, to be precise, for for 20 years. So I I still have a, a great deal of fondness for Minneapolis. But um, Ted Williams and Carly Ostremski were Millers. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, as, as was Willie Mays, because for a brief period, they were the Giants. Ah. Uh, they were the Giants farm team. But, um, uh, but the other thing, the, the sad thing is that they are um, no more, because when the Minnesota Twins uh, were acquired, the Senators moved from uh, Washington, D.C. to Minneapolis and became uh, the Minneapolis, the uh, Minnesota Twins, the, the Millers uh, ceased to exist. So, so this is a this is a little piece of history. Yeah, and a piece of your piece of your uh, history too, which is it, a <laughs> it brings a lot of strands together. Boston, Minnesota. Wow, your your story, the exhibit story. story, the your story, the exhibit That's story. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Well, thanks so much, hey. Paul, for um, for inviting me on, and I, I hope this is of interest to some people out there. Um, you know, we might be having to do a lot more virtual museuming in the future. You know, we museums are public spaces, and unfortunately, they they uh, they are not good for social distancing. So yeah, uh, so it's going to be a while before we um, get back to normal. I'm afraid. Well, so we'll uh, so we'll uh, adapt in the meantime, and this is this is uh, what these videos hopefully are for too. So yeah, thanks again. All right, all right. Cheers. Cheers.